You are now doing less. I'm your host, Jeff, and I'm joined with my unwelcomed squatter, John. How are you doing today, John? <laughs> I'm good. I I made my I found my way onto this podcast uh, a while ago and just never left, never paid rent. Just uh... yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, I'm not allowed to kick him out until one year. So you get one year of John. And then uh, this podcast will be a lot more enjoyable without him. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> you look you look happy, man. What did you did you buy some Tesla a few days ago? Is that why you look so happy? <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm just happy. I'm just a happy guy. I didn't, but I I didn't buy any Tesla. No. I, it was fun to watch though. Interesting roller coaster ride. That we I guess we have to to talk about it just because. Um, in previous podcasts, we mentioned Tesla specifically as like a, a money losing company that's not a good investment. <laughs> well, like it's, it's not losing money anymore. It's made money two two consecutive quarters, so they got yeah, that but it's got to make a lot more money uh, <laughs> to to be able to cover all the losses it has, it's posted to date. <laughs> that is true. They have lost a lot of money, but I will say. In recent history, out of the past six quarters, four of them had positive earnings, so that's not that bad. Well, I will say I read something online that said uh, at the at the peak of this of this like melt up for Tesla, mm-hmm. where it went up like what something like thirty percent in two days. Yeah. So for said, your guys' reference, it went 30%. up from in, at the start of the year, it was at like. 400 after the earnings release it wasn't right after but a a week after the earnings release in of q4 it went up to almost a thousand it just it was just shy of a thousand so it went uh, over a hundred percent yeah like 40 40 percent of that was in like two days this week we're recording this on a third on thursday night and uh monday tuesday it on over those two days, it went up like twenty percent per day, which is crazy. I don't really have any context offhand, but that's just like, especially for a company well, with the market cap yeah. like Tesla, which which is where I was going with the, with what I was going to say was, uh, I read online that Tesla Tesla's market cap at the end of that second day of twenty hmm. percent growth was larger mm-hmm. than four hundred ninety four of the five hundred companies in the S and P five hundred. But it will not be added to the S and P five hundred because, in order to be added to the S and P five hundred, you have to have four consecutive <laughs> quarters of profitable, of of positive, of positive earnings. <laughs> Dude, that's that's crazy. The idea that it's bigger than almost every like the valuation is higher than almost every company that is considered like one of the most valuable companies is nuts. But like, it can't make the list because it hasn't made money. <laughs> Enough. Time. Well, you said it. It made him uh, had a profitable quarter with what? What was the latest earnings? The latest earnings per share was two dollars six cents. <laughs> so that means that means if it's trading right. at nine hundred and sixty eight dollars and ninety nine cents on two dollars of earnings per share, that means it's like five a P of like five hundred. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's like. I mean. PE is kind of not a useful metric the closer it is to zero because like the limit as PE goes to zero is Mm. infinite. And once you hit negative, it's a meaningless number, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's not completely meaningless, but it's like the price you should pay for any company that doesn't earn money and you know it's never going to earn money is zero. Right. (laughs) So it's just like, really, it just PE's it stops to be meaningful when when it's around that like zero mark. But the funny thing is, it doesn't really matter how much you say that because if people are willing to buy it, then the price goes up. And that's what happened on Monday and Tuesday. The price went right. up a lot. And a for, lot of people for context, price to earnings ratio can be thought of as sort of like a, a measurement on how long it'll take to get your investment back. Right. Cause like, Imagine just any arbitrary investment. It doesn't even have to be a stock, right? If you paid $100 for something that yields you $20 a year, whatever it may be, 
it could be a loan or anything like that, then that yield, you can yield can be arbit, like generalized to anything. Then if you just take that price you paid for it, divided by the yield, that tells you how long it'll take to get your money back, right? So if you paid $100 and at you get $20 a year, you take, f- right, at that yield, assuming it stays constant. At that current, But like, yeah. again, that there's speculation here. Right? Like people expect the earnings to go up. And that's why they're trying to get, they're all trying to pile in now because they think this is going to be the next biggest company in the world, right? So it's like, if everyone piles in now, then it's kind of funny, right? Because like, even if this Tesla, if Tesla just holds its current price, like it'll just sort of naturally grow. Like it would just be, if it just stayed flat at this price, and it did grow into one of the world's biggest companies, what a boring stock that would be, right? Like just all the speculation <laughs> happening right now was perfect, right? And then just <laughs> over like 20 years, it just s- finally grew into this valuation. And people were like, yep, see, we told you. But it's like the stock wouldn't move for like 20 years. <laughs> it's like we were right. It only took 20 years, but we, see, we, we nailed it. We got the exact right price that we knew it was right. going to be worth. Right before we retire in 20 years. So it was a good investment. <laughs> it's just like, good job. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, you, That's so wild. You, pre- you told the future. You predicted the future perfectly. Yeah. yeah. And it did drop a decent amount from its high. Uh, Nine, like it went from 1,000. It's now in like the seven to 800 range. Yeah. It didn't hit 1,000. It, it, it was nine, 968.99 was the high. Which Imagine funny. buying at that number though. Like someone did, right? Someone so did, yeah. like I just I cannot understand. I mean, I obviously didn't buy it hundreds of dollars ago, but like these price targets are pretty insane. Like I saw the C- CNBC has some analysts on there and she said the price target for Tesla in 5 years is $7,000. <laughs> <laughs> <It's> just, yeah, <laughs> I I like, did see that and I I follow someone on Twitter who is an economist named Mike Larson, and he plotted mm-hmm. that, what that would look like, and he pointed out that the growth on Monday and Tuesday, like 20% per day, is like, mm-hmm. it's like a little, it's actually a little bit over, but it's like, he's like, we can we can expect days like this, there's going to be a lot more to come because it pretty much has to do this every day to reach uh, 7,000 <laughs> in five years. <laughs> like it has to continue this absurd growth rate to 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 right. even reach the hat price target. Right. Yeah, and like the, here's what's really crazy about it, right? Too is like companies in real life cannot grow that fast. Like they just can't. And there there's a good reason for that is people are risk adverse, right? So like they're only going to invest and take out loans and all these different strategies according to what they're currently seeing in revenue. Like people are anchored to their current revenue when they plan ahead for like future years. Like they're not completely set to it, but it's like, you're not going to hire five times as many people as you need because you're just expecting this insane level of growth because that's such a risky thing to do. You're going to hire it, you know, one new team at a time. You're going to do, you're going to like, if imagine if you owned a restaurant, right? And your restaurant was wildly successful. Are you going to open a hundred new chains or are you going to open one new chain of your restaurant, see how it goes, go from there, maybe open two more and then you kind of get the picture, right? But like no one has a wildly successful restaurant and then opens 800 more like the next year. It just, it can't happen, right? And so... Yeah, if I could say something about that, there's kind of like mm-hmm. an, inter- t- there's two interesting forces at play with expanding a business. Um, mm-hmm. like you said, if you're, if a company is like extremely profitable and there's a lot of reason for it to expand, right. Mm-hmm. That's a force to get more people using or more people on their staff, right. To mm-hmm. expand and be able to, 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 uh, facilitate more product, more revenue, right. So that right. they have this growth force occurring within the business. But if the business truly is profitable, there's some kind of secret sauce, it, Assumedly, there's some kind of secret sauce that it it actually takes some time to 
to spread that to the new peoples, right? So if you, if you right. really are profitable um, and you bring on, you open up a new location, right? It's going to take some time to teach this secret way of actually being profitable. If it wasn't secret, if it wasn't hard to know, then other people would just automatically be doing that in other, in your competitors. So like right. that's, there's actually like a limiting force where it's like the faster you are able to grow, the more likely other people can just copy you where if you, if right. you have a legitimate case to grow fast, it's actually going to be tough because it's going to be making people do things a different way or using resources in a different way than is probably the norm. So it actually limit. There's like a resistance on that force to grow fast. Right. That's a really good point. Um, and yeah, so the reality is like, yeah, companies can double their revenue in a year. That's not crazy. Um, that's certainly within the realms of possibility, but to continue doubling their size every year is generally, it's not common. So like we said in, it's easier in companies where the team size is actually not needed to expand. Like you don't actually have any real capital expenses to grow your business. Like something like a social network, while they do start to employ a lot more people, it can grow really, really ridiculously fast um, because you don't like once the network is up and running, just the more people to use it, the more profit you make. Right. So it's, it, it, you're going to need more additional resources like servers and things like that. But you know, it's you, they can grow really fast. But um, my point is the growth rate in the stock is not indicative of how fast a company can grow in real life. And so people are essentially speculating on where this company will be many years in the future. Like the more the, the, the price jumps up, the further ahead they're speculating, you can think of it like. So it's, it's, they're really pushing out this target because they can't hope to achieve this price target with like, they can't hope to make their earnings merit this price target within a reasonable time frame. So the more that price to earnings goes up, the farther out the, in the future that people are essentially speculating. And if you know anything about pr- like forecasting or you've ever looked at, at like the weather forecast, you know the further out you go, the much more unreliable things get. And so it's it's pretty obvious apparent to me that the speculation going on with this thing is just out of control yeah there's a lot of liquidity sloshing around that's finding its way into the market <laughs> in ways that can be seen probably in this uh stock melt up of tesla anyway that's not actually what we're going to be talking about um for the rest of the time we just wanted to mention that because it is pretty interesting and we did we have been talking about that in previous podcast episodes so I had to comment on it but uh what we are going to be talking about is something that was mentioned in the last podcast about how GDP is more it, GDP is a proxy is an imperfect proxy of actual economic growth of actual the state of the economy um, how the real measure you know the real important measure which is the standard of living in an economy is mm. the thing to be measured which you can't do it you you know every economist will admit like you can't actually know accurately like what is the standard of living in an economy you can't point to a number or a statistic that lets on to that but gdp turns out to be the best proxy in according to economists and politicians and um business people and you know bi- people in business so they so gdp is very widely used it's the most widely used economic statistic that uh in no way does that make it perfect. And we're just going to be commenting on that more in depth and uh, talk about talk about the right. ramifications of that. I like to think of all these different metrics as sort of like a map. If you have all these different metrics that are individually proxies that may be correlated with the thing you're trying to measure, which is standard of living, but that's such in itself such a complicated concept that you can't really measure it with a single number then you you make all these proxies that are correlated to it and those things they build a map i I like to think of it as a map to what you're actually 
trying to find. And, uh, and the reason I like this analogy is because if you think about it, if you're trying to get somewhere and you're using a map to find your way there, your, your ability to get where you're trying to go is only as good as your map. If your map of like where you're trying to get to is fuzzy and confusing and it even has places in the wrong place, you're never going to find, like you're just going to be lost, right? The better your map resembles reality, the easier it is to navigate where you're trying to go. And you can think about this in terms of health, right? Uh, if you ask if someone's healthy, well, that's, you know, how do you answer that question? Like you can't measure health, right? The health is not, you can't really say a number one to 10. I'm eight health. Like that's, that doesn't, that's not a meaningful thing to say. So what you do is you have all these proxies. Okay. What's their heart rate? What's their blood pressure? Um, but there's so many different things going on in the human body uh, that like you, you may be healthy according to, you know, almost every metric, but you could still then have prostate cancer at an early age because they don't even check for that. Right. So it's like, you may be unhealthy in a way they're not even measuring because most people don't get checked for that until they're 40 and then it just goes unnoticed. So it's, you're only as good as the, the measures you're taking and their accuracy. If you measure your heart rate and your machinery is off and it says your heart rate is normal, but it's not, then again, you don't have a good picture of your health. And so I would probably argue an economy, actually, I'm, it's probably of equal complexity. I, I don't know which one would be more complex, the human body or an economy, but I, I think they're both really complicated. It's hard to say which would be more complicated, I think, but the re that's my point is, it, often people like to get second opinions when they go to a doctor because the human body is so complicated and people can be wrong. Um, and so like, it, it's just, it's good to have competition in, in healthcare, just like it should be, it's important to have competition in an economy. Like you, you don't want to just take a few people's impressions of how things are going and then just use that to like plan how everything plays out from there. Yeah. That I was, I was, I didn't realize you were going there. That's actually perfect. Um, th like you would never just get a diagnosis that changes your life and then, well, maybe you would, but most people would get that <laughs> and say, okay, I'm going to have a second opinion, you know, just, mm -hmm. it doesn't, how can that hurt? If it's, if it's going to change your life, the, fr the best thing you can do is get all the information possible before acting. Right. Right. In our economy, Decisions are made, money flows are contingent upon these number prints. Like the government publishes mm -hmm. these numbers. And once they print what they, you know, what they found, there's massive movements. And they just take those numbers for, for granted as if it's like the actual read. Even though these mm -hmm. numbers themselves get revised <laughs> after, after the fact, right? There's no right. measure of, of a, like a con confidence interval of these numbers when they get the, printed, like... We are 99% sure the GDP in the last quarter went up at a 0.4% rate, whatever. If if that was the case, I mean, that's that would be like impossible to do. It would be more like we're 60% or we're 70% sure that it was <laughs> right. plus or minus 0.5%, you know, of the, right. of the G GDP estimate. So it's like, uh, and there's so much policy and there's so much like, uh, yeah, like politics, business, forecasting, investing, what else? Yeah, like there's so much that rides on like, oh, is this growth? Is this another one is unemployment, the unemployment rate that people people look at and also CPI because, well, CPI goes along with the GDP. So CPI is consumer price index, and that is actually used as a adjustment to the GDP because mm -hmm. when the, the consumer price index which is a measure of inflation, goes up a lot. That means that a, a, a spike in GDP may not be as significant if everything got more expensive. So there's kind of like a balance between GDP when it's corrected by uh, moves in prices. And so even that, so there, that's another measurement that's subject to error, right? And there's error propagation, right? If you're measuring something mm -hmm. and there's 
uh, and there's a confidence interval within which it's likely to have accurately been measured. And then there's something else within a confidence interval within which it also is likely to have been measured. Well, those errors propagate. And then the, the result of using both of those could be a combination. It could be potentially, you know, the worst case would be they're both off by the extent of the of each of its ranges to the low or to the high. And the number is that mm. much more off. <laughs> so it's like all right. this... You, you would think that if all this was taken into account, people would hear these numbers and say, yeah, it seems like we have lower GDP growth, but we can't be sure, right? We're not going to make mm. any rash decisions. Whereas um, like a negative GDP, GDP print is has been um like the cause for like stock the stock market to sell off for example like people and lose. lots of policy change right policy so like change, yeah the policy the fiscal policy changes a lot when you're in recession if you look at 2008 when we were entering recession i mean it w i guess it wasn't necessarily the fact that they're we were in recession but uh like a few companies going bankrupt or you decide to bail these companies out so like that's a fiscal policy decision and like generally just our our decisions are influenced by these measurements and so it's like we treat them like they're perfect right but it's again i guess the confidence interval thing which is so important like it's so important to understand what could be the error in your measurement and yet no one ever really talks about that right so but it, it, this is such an important concept right so Let's say you, you go to the beach and you scoop up a handful of sand and you said, how many grains of sand do you think there are in your hand? And you might go, I don't know, a thousand. And then someone else goes, all right, I have three grains of sand in my hand right here. I count them and they add that to your pile and they say, how many grains of sand do you have now? You wouldn't say a thousand and three. Like, like, like you have that level of accuracy. That's an absurd thing to say. You'd still say, oh, I don't know, it's still about a thousand because you weren't that sure in the first place. Yeah. So like, this is a reason error is so important. Like when you say a thousand, you have to know it's plus or minus a hundred, yeah. right? Like that, that, that error interval, that confidence interval is so key to the measurements. And yet, I mean, they may report them, but it's not a lot of people take stock in in this sort of stuff and maybe it's like laziness or just kind of our desire to have definitive answers to things like i don't think we like hearing reports when they say oh it's this or it could be that or like we like having answers mm -hmm. and so we t i think our inclination is to disregard you know how the confidence intervals at the end of measurements but it's it's really so important especially when it comes to these aggregations we have right like GDP, you're aggregating an entire country of activity. And it's like you're grouping things like all the transactions that happen in Wyoming. You, you're grouping those in with all the transactions that happen in California as if they're completely identical. Right. Like you don't there's no discrimination between geographic location and then like time period matters, too. And they try to account for this with something called the CPI which is the consumer price index. And that tells you how expensive things are today currently. But a simple example of why this is so, so difficult to do is you could say an iPhone today is worth, is, is about a thousand dollars. If you get like the top end one, right? If you get the most current one, is that about right, John? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So let's say it's like about a thousand dollars. Okay, so, but 10 years ago, like, I think the first iPhone was, it, it's still, it was still in that price range. I don't know if it was that expensive, but it, you know, it was somewhere in that ballpark. But the iPhone 10 is much better than the first iPhone. So, yes, it's slightly more expensive, but it's also much improved. So, if it hadn't improved, its price would actually probably be much, much lower. And we can tell because the original iPhone is, I don't know, I don't know even, I don't think you could find one of those, but it wouldn't go for very much money these days. So the question is, like, how do you factor in the improvement, which is very much a subjective measure, 
into the price increase. Like if you wanted to know, like, you know, like my standard of living has gone up because my phone is better, right? But that's not necessarily indicated by the price hike or reduction. So trying to add up all these different things across all these different products, you start to see how absurdly difficult this is of a task to come up with an average price of things. Right. You know? Um, yeah, to piggyback off that example of, like, the iPhone, if you were to, like, actually ask people, like, what is this new iPhone that you just spent another $1,000? Like, you just mar- you just marginally spent $1,000 to basically maintain... Like, if you had an iPhone before, you're maintaining your standard of living, call it, and you're mm-hmm. spending this... Like, what's the value? And people might say, like, oh, like, it's faster. Oh, it's got more capabilities or something. Which, the faster part you know, is less to be proven. Like, like people aren't saying like, mm-hmm. oh, there's, I saved 40 milliseconds on every single click. You know I mean? There, there's, those <laughs> metrics don't exist. So it's like, <laughs> if, if that's what you're attributing the fast, the, the speed of your iPhone um, increase to, well, it, it, it's not been tested. It's not really been, you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into that. So maybe d- kind of like discount that for a second. But if you're saying like, oh, extra features, like, oh, like it has a heart rate sensor. Oh, it, you know, does this, does that. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I could, but I could make you a like a heart, like an engineer could make you a heart rate sensor that you could keep in your pocket for probably mm-hmm. around five bucks. <laughs> the components mm-hmm. are maybe five, ten bucks. It's like, I'll, I'll, you can keep that with you. You saved a thousand dollars, but you, you know, you have a another s- device, right? That the, so if it's like you truly just want your heart rate measured, you could save a thousand bucks or whatever the <laughs> right. features are, right? Right. Um, the components are actually nowhere near that expensive so it's like what mm. are you really it, it, it all all of this i'm trying to describe it's just like very subjective like someone's like no i'd rather just carry right. out an iphone that does everything that i need to do and that makes me happy and it's just like okay well other people may w- prefer to just like all they care about is i keep using the heart rate sensor which is just <laughs> one example but it's like other people may only care about that and they c- carry with them you know a heart they they might wear a heart rate sensor on their person like strapped to them all day because that's what they truly care about. So it's like, how are we measuring heart rate, the price of having your heart rate monitored in our in, our, in the CPI? Like, how is that reflected? Like, I've just explained to you two wildly subjective uh, <laughs> approaches. Like, one person spent $1,000 to to achieve that capability lumped in with, with other kind of indiscriminate capabilities, whereas this other person spent $5, you know? So it's just like, and that's just that's just the... That's just kind of attacking the credibility of the measurement itself. That doesn't even begin to state what Jeff, you kind of mentioned, I think. It varies location, like geographically also. Like <laughs> the, mm-hmm. the price of a Big Mac Significantly. is like twice a, yeah, it's a price of a Big Mac is like twice as expensive in Manhattan than it is in like Phoenix, which is like, those are both mm-hmm. metropolitan areas. So it's not like, I mean, there's, it's not even the furthest extent of the range that you would see in a single country. And yet we, we track the CPI of a country unilaterally right. or like it's all in unison, right? How is that possible? Right. Like that it, there's so much range. The credibility of the measure is, is off in my opinion. And mm-hmm. it, it could vary so wildly. I mean, what it's, I mean, if you look at it, it's what it's trying to do. It's over time. What is the purchasing power of a dollar? Right. Right. That's the there, goal of it. And if there's one measure for a whole country and houses probably in Manhattan, again, probably went up 20 times in the last, mm-hmm. like 20, like a price of a house is like 20 times what it was maybe a hundred years ago. I don't know the numbers at all. I'm just, and then in mm-hmm. rural Idaho, the price of the houses maybe went up eight times right mm-hmm. so there again that like if you're trying to compare dollars to dollars 100 years ago to today which is the true benefit of tracking cpi it's like you can't even do like you've just lost credibility in that way that 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 same dollar relatively in a in a in different cities um you, lo- you like you lost its tracking capability right and just aggregating things in general is a dangerous thing to do when you're trying to look at like averages and aggregates and all these different ways you can look at like many different things at with one number is like you you have to take these numbers with a huge grain of salt. You have to understand 
the like the math or the 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 function that went into creating the aggregate. If you don't understand the function that made the aggregate, you can start to make like assumptions that are completely untrue. Like here's a, a very simple example. If you had a room full of people and one of the people in the room uh, was Jeff Bezos and you said, you know, how's the, how's the average person doing financially in this room? Well, how would you do that? You could just add up all their incomes and then divide them by the number of people in the room and then you get an average. And you might, then you say, okay, this is on average how much money these each person in the room is earning. But it's it you can see how clearly absurd that is because the average person in that room is not doing anywhere near as well as Jeff Bezos, and he's skewing the average wildly. And I know you can just use a median instead, right? But that's a very simple calculation. What we're saying is GDP and CPI, these kinds of ag aggregates are much more complicated than just averaging something. And so the function that maps to them is much more complicated, and the assumptions it, it makes are a lot more difficult to navigate. So when you look at these numbers, it I think we're using them with much too fine a level of precision, precision than they deserve. Uh, and, and like, really, I think if we're looking at GDP and CPI and things like that, maybe we can compare them between uh, countries that are doing vastly differently in terms of standard of living. Like the, maybe then it, it starts, it has merit. But even like two countries that are similar, I think the gray area that goes into determining these things is so huge that comparing them is almost a meaningless, meaningless endeavor. Yeah, definitely. So economists love to use these data. I mean, this is, this is economics. This is what economists mm -hmm. use to enact policy, to, you know, to monitor health of an economy, to, um, monitor how things are changing how you know all this stuff it's like this is the the ground level of like what these people are using and like we're mm -hmm. <laughs> we're coming off the bat and saying okay ground level it's not working <laughs> like it's already <laughs> you, you, you know you already lost me in terms of is this adequate i guess i'll say right well like they they build all these models that depend on the data but if the data is right fuzzy then your model is pointless or useless. Yeah, like, definitely. So I was just listening to um, some of some of our opposition, I'll call, in our uh, mm. theoretical debate between us and... Uh, <laughs> it's not an actual debate because we're not face-to-face -face or having direct communication with these people. And these people are more famous than us. But like the... <laughs> you call them the MMTers, the modern monetary theorists. Or like the... I guess you could call them... Like anyone in favor of like central banking or... You know, central banking, like well, there's people who like central banking. Like Milton Freeman was in favor of central banking, but he just he wasn't a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, so oh, yeah, I'm just like level. There's levels to it. <laughs> yeah, certainly. I'm just drawing a. Uh, <laughs> the, I guess the people that would oppose us on this issue are all kind of included in the the fact that they say, "Oh, well, yeah, you have to use these numbers. That you know, that's how you tell the health of the economy." Mm -hmm. Well. They, they're coming up with things that are like to the, like per month basis. Like mm -hmm. you get a print on like the unemployment in a certain month, right? You start to enact policy automatically. That's the kind of way that they're going. Economists are pushing towards, you know, up to, up to the minute or not up to the minute, up to the month, essentially reaction in, in fiscal policy and in mm -hmm. monetary policy. And it's like, yeah, I mean, we've we've been saying how inaccurate these numbers could be. So to mm -hmm. to actually have a reaction uh, would completely skew uh, what may be the appropriate allocation of resources. So an example of the, of what I'm trying to get at would be, say, the farming sector is doing great, but mm -hmm. banking, financial services, for some reason, are doing terrible. Mm -hmm. Right? These are two very different sectors. And they very well could be doing very different. 
our our GDP tracks them as if they do the same, right? The, the economic right. growth is just a broad, blunt number that it's all right. encompassing, right? So if banking and financial, which is actually a huge sector, right? It, it has a lot of GDP accounting from it. Right, just monetary, like just money services, financial services. Yeah, if um, you add in real estate to that, that's the biggest sector of our economy. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So if it, if that if that starts to do bad for some reason, I'm not going to even speculate on what it would be, but just you could imagine that it does bad. Mm -hmm. Then we could potentially go into a recession, and having farming perfectly be fine. Like ha farming is perfectly <laughs> fine, right? Right. So it if the, if these opposers to us. What they say, if that gets enacted, right, there would be a flood of stimulus and it would prop up the failing sector, right? Because that money would, assumedly, in their opinion, in their, the way they would want to allocate that money would be to, to save the people that are losing their jobs, that are, you know, they're struggling, the businesses that are struggling, right? So there would be this m massive stimulus in that sector. Well, in a free economy, that would be actually a signal say, hey, people that are living maybe in more concentrated areas where there's more financial services, move mm. out towards the farming sector and start to do more farming and start to do more mm. profitable things or something. You know what I mean? That would be a, right. an actual physical, real life economic situation that would occur as a direct result of some sector, you know, doing very bad. Uh, right. Like measuring the aggregate of all the sectors of your economy is like measuring the aggregate of the health of 10 different patients and then giving them all the same medicine. Right. It's, yeah. it's as absurd, right? That's exactly. So, what I'm yeah. Yeah. And so like you have all these different markets and sub markets going on in our country at the same time and they all do different things and they all are having trouble or like, you know, they all have their own issues or whatever it may be. And, you know, they may need different things or whatever you have it. So if you had five people and three of them had cancer, are you going to give everyone three fists the chemo they need? Like it just, it doesn't make, <laughs> that's yet. an absurd conclusion to arrive at. So it's, it's like, you can't, this is what we're talking about when we say aggregates are useful in some cases, but not, they're not the be all end all. And you can't have this central action when you're acting on an aggregate. Cause you can't just, have a single action spread out among many different things equally and have it like benefit yeah. everyone in the right way. It right. just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so we, and so we could talk about, so GDP, it's not even a debate. It's the most looked at number for health of, a, in a, for health of economy, for growth of economy, right? It's synonymous with mm -hmm. economic growth. It's you're talking about GDP growth. Let's take a little trip down a theoretical <laughs> a theoretical path that could have happened, you know, in the past or could happen in the future. Completely theoretical. Um, let's talk about so when GDP was discovered as a indicator, people, you know, really saw the the benefits, saw the value to that and you see today it became very prevalent as the uh, as the indicator that people use to get their read on the economy. Well, what if additionally to GDP, to gross domestic product, um, we came about tracking the another GDP, the gross domestic penetration. <laughs> <laughs> we started measuring the amount that people are having sex in the economy, right? Because people said, the economists all agree, oh, when people are doing good, right? There's more money going around. There's more free time. There's more leisure. Well, people are just meeting people more and just having, when you have more leisure time and you meet more people, you have sex more. Well, and then, like, and then conversely, people that are out of a job, people that in, a, in a, a co an economy that's strapped for resources, well, they're too busy looking for jobs or looking for productive activities and they're insecure in their lifestyle and they're not able to have like a stable foundation and they're not having sex as often. <laughs> right. So th somehow in this economy, they're able to track to a degree of accuracy, even say the number of times people are having sex in a, over a given time period. Um, <laughs> so you can, <laughs> so just imagine, <laughs> right. 
to, to start to think about like the ramifications of that. They might not have a higher standard of living, but they're pretty fucking cool in my book. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's it's in that short theory, that two sentence or like whatever, like one paragraph long theory. It's like, okay, yeah, I could see it. Same thing goes for <laughs> gross domestic product. Like the the amount of times people are transacting in the economy, it's like mm-hmm. the more people are transacting, the more money they have, the more you know, the more they're able to spend, the more that's just a good indicator of like how high what kind of transactions are we talking here, John? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but it sounds ridiculous. But when you think about it, it's is it any more ridiculous to measure that number than it is to say, okay, because look at this, ready? Let's say you make a lot of money and your wife wants to be a stay-at-home mom and you can afford to have her do that, right? That's not going to get added into the GDP, because no money changes hands. But uh, if you th- thought about same scenario, your wife decided to be a nanny for someone else and gets paid. Now money is changing hands officially and it does get added into the GDP. So it's literally the same exact amount of productivity happening. Uh, in fact, it'd probably be more in the stay at home case. There's probably more productivity happening there. But one gets measured and one doesn't. Right. So it's like when you're measuring the aggregate of all transactions happening, I, that's, that's clearly a proxy for what we want. Just like gross domestic, gross domestic penetration is a proxy <laughs> yeah, for what I mean, we want to measure. I mean, is that not something everybody wants more of in their life? Right. You know, like. <laughs> yeah, I mean, on the surface, you could say like, yeah, I guess that would be a good. I mean, certainly the same as GDP, like we were saying, like there is a kind of like when you're talking about marginally different GDP, it's like you kind of lose it in the inaccuracy of the measure. But when you're talking about grossly different, you know, like mm-hmm. massively different, like when you talk about like on the whole living in a country with a GDP of like $600 per capita mm-hmm. versus living in a country with $70,000, uh, you know, gross domestic product per capita, it's like and this is what mentioned in the last podcast it's like it's like almost certain that living in the one with more gross domestic product by that like a different like a a factor of a a thousand well actually i would say if you get low enough it it actually even stops being even being a useful measurement at all right so with countries that have like really low gdp what's happening there is uh People are mostly self, self-sufficient. And so they don't do a lot of exchanging, right? They'll live off their own land. So if you have land, you're doing okay. And if you don't have land, you're doing horrible probably in, that, in a society like that. And so, you know, they might uh, raise their own livestock, um, grow their own food. You know, they have their own housing, et cetera, et cetera. And so there's not a lot of money changing hands in a self-sufficient economy like that. And so if you're trying to compare two self-sufficient co- economies by GDP, GDP is only capturing a small fraction of the productivity, right? Mm-hmm. It's only, maybe it only captures 10% of the actual productivity happening in a world like that or in a country like that. And so at that point, the number becomes kind of useless. And so, you know, that's just another example of, again, why you, like... Yeah, it's probably better to live in the one that's way higher GDP. Mm-hmm. But I don't think, and I mean, I don't think there's any countries like this. But if there was, imagine a country where everyone div- like built AI robots. So they had like a farming robots. They had butlers and like basically just automated a whole bunch of different things. And so... They essentially never need, they didn't even need money, but all their needs were taken care of by these robots. Like that's, that'd be pretty cool living that life. Right. But the GDP would be zero. (laughs) So, Mm -hmm. you know, theoretically it doesn't approach meaning. Yeah. That's just more of a reason why, yeah, GDP is an imperfect measure because the GDP per capita of 600 could mean Mm -hmm. that the people are starving uh, you know there's not right. enough to go around it could also just mean everybody's happily self-sustaining 
um, and right. they don't need to transact often. So again, that's a so GDP is losing that aspect of the economic activity, right? Mm -hmm. But so going back to so the reason I'm drawing this absurd kind of comparison to like this theoretical gross domestic penetration, right? <laughs> it's like so without even speaking to whether or not uh, how good of an indicator it would be, because I guess you know you could argue that it would or wouldn't, and say that they come out with data that it's like a really good indicator. It's better than GDP, <laughs> like it's better than gross domestic pro production, and uh, someone wins like an economic. Nobel Prize for this discovery, mm -hmm. right? Oh, if we're only tracking gross domestic penetration, then we'll be able to <laughs> actually adequately apply, you know, correct fiscal policy and correct <laughs> monetary policy. Like, you know, whatever. That's like the right. stuff they give Nobel Prizes for in economics. Right. Um, so now think about what happens in that society. And what happens in that society is actually the same as what happens in a society that just measures gross domestic production right politicians mm -hmm. realize that if everybody's looking at this number as a source of how good is the economy and if i make the economy better as president or as congressman then i get reelected so i'm going to actually do what i think like if i have a limited budget or you know theoretically limited resource allocation as a congressman or you know anyone in power right that's my job i have to allocate resources i have to enact policy in a way that is going to make people happiest well if i if i have two options one of them is going to make people happier like actually happier which is possible mm -hmm. without raising gdp but the other one is going to raise gdp it's like it, i don't really know how much happiness it's going to bring well i actually don't care about how much happiness it's going to bring i'm just going <laughs> to do the one that's going to raise the gdp almost artificially in some cases because that's going to get me reelected and you can see this. You can see, I mean, our current president, Trump, tweets every time. <laughs> well, he mostly looks at the stock market, which is another indicator, which is like. Which is even more imperfect. Is, right. It's, than GDP. Because we started this podcast talking about how much speculation that could be. So it's like wildly not tethered. But, uh, right. if, you, but if you have good GDP, then you can advertise it. Oh, you know, that my economy is so great. This is the greatest economy in the history of the world because, you know, so, and so on and so forth. Right. So if if GD, if gross domestic penetration was in play, right, <laughs> you can think of how creepy that would be. That That's like Trump or think of like Bernie Sanders or like mm -hmm. Joe Biden, like telling you like, oh, we're going to enact a policy where like food is more aphrodisiacs come down in price. It's like, well, why? It's like, <laughs> oh, they're actually government subsidized. It's like that's the right. stuff you would start to see. You would start to see like what's going to get people mo having more sex. And it's like <laughs> it's like. Okay, you realize that that's not what makes the economy good. The economy is good, and so people are having more sex. It's like if you have right. make people have more sex, it's like that doesn't say anything about the economy. In fact, right. there's like a lot of indicators that might like some people that do have a lot of sex say like, oh, it makes my life worse because I don't have like a meaningful relationship. So it's like, right, it, it just coming up with like a good indicator, if that was a good mm -hmm. indicator, doesn't say <laughs> like. In fact, that could like make society worse. Because now you're just focusing. Now you know what you're focusing on, and it's like, right? Like Jeff was saying, the analogy of the map. It's like it doesn't matter how many like points of reference you have on your map if the map is just not telling the whole picture. And it's like it doesn't matter how closely you follow that those points of reference. Right. It's like not going to end well. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like so, if you had a map of where you're trying to get to, and you're you're getting there slowly right and it's like oh man taking it's taking forever to get there if the map is wrong and you get in a car and get there and you get there quicker that's not any better because you still got to the wrong place so it's like gdp is just a proxy so if we if we get this number to go up that doesn't necessarily mean we're doing better it just means gdp is higher and so you have this self-enforcing feedback loop where it's like, okay, we agreed this number is important and we're going to do things that increase this number, but it's not guaranteed that every increase in this number correlates with an increase of standard living until, unless you know the underlying function that maps it, right? So like if everybody's retired in your country because they're so wealthy and the GDP is like drops tremendously because of it, 
that's not a bad thing. That drop in GDP is fine. You know, that like, so if you are suddenly like, all right, no, we got to do something about this low GDP number, you're fixing a problem that doesn't exist. And so, yeah, I think this really at the heart of what we're trying to get at here is we're trying to point out how difficult it is to model complex systems like an economy. Yeah, we're not sitting here, and I, I say this all the time, but John and I aren't sitting here telling you we have a better model for the economy than these PhD economists do. We're not saying we have a better model. We're saying how difficult it is to model something accurately and therefore how foolish it is to try to plan something centrally using models that are just never going to be accurate enough to accomplish your goals. Yeah. So if you think that gross domestic penetration, <laughs> wouldn't it be a good measure? <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> I think that, <laughs> I think that every measure that is attempts that people attempt to use, people should be skeptical of. We should be more skeptical mm -hmm. to, uh, to reference those MMT years again, the monetary the modern monetary theory theorists, right? Their, their whole thing is like, Whatever you can do to increase spending, that is increasing GDP. It's like, that's what you want. You want the increased GDP. If you like, if there's a, if there's a higher GDP, they just keep, they just like, they don't realize that it's, it's a self-fulfilling loop. It's right. And here, here's another huge example of that is uh, the broken window fallacy, right? So this is something so many people fall into these days because they've been convinced that just spending is good. We just need more spending. Spending's good for the economy. Everyone says this all the time. And this has caused so many people to adopt what is called the broken window fallacy. Okay. So imagine you own a home and your kids are playing around and your kid throws a rock at your window and it breaks your window. Okay. So now you have a house with a broken window. Okay. So you spend $100 for a window repairman to fix your window. And then now you've just, you've created a job, right? That was a job to fix the window. You've increased the GDP by $100, right? Because you paid them $100 to fix your window. And so you might say, wow, look, look at that. The GDP increased and we added a job. That was good for the economy. It was good that your son broke your window because it increased GDP, right? And it's like, well, you're right that it was good for GDP, but how is anyone with a half a brain <laughs> knows it's not good to have your windows broken all the time? And why is that? If you think carefully, if he breaks your window and you spend money to fix that, that means you're not spending money on other things you want, okay? So just because you destroyed this resource and you had to replace it, that replacing it activity stimulates the GDP, but it, at the core of what we want, we want stuff. So now you have a house with complete windows, but you had that before. Yeah. Whereas if your son never broke your window, you could have a house with working windows and you could have a pair of shoes or I don't know, whatever else you would have bought that money. So your <laughs> you could wealth would have been higher. You could, you could write a check to the window repairman. He doesn't have yeah, to do any work. Just give it to him. Just, just give him the <laughs> Right. And so it, I, this I just another example that runs rampant in people's logic today. That is, it's like you, you have to go back to like core principles of just what is it that we want? And is this action achieving that end? You know, people get so wrapped up in these models, these mathematical models, but they don't think about the assumptions that go into these models. Yeah, I guess. So start thinking about GDP as if it were less meaningful because it very well may be <laughs> start thinking of it as like if if they started reporting the number of times people had sex in a given time period <laughs> you might you might start to think to yourself i don't think that that's attributable to good policy or you know anything especially if you were like you yourself aren't getting laid and like you're reading oh the gdp is going the gross domestic penetration is higher than it's, it's ever like, been what do you care and it's just like 
Uh, it's you know. <laughs> you're like you're like guys. <laughs> yeah. Guys. Like, so. Am I the only one? Right. It's hard to hear that like we're condemning like GDP because then you're like, oh, is the whole f- field of economics wrong? <laughs> it's just like. <laughs> I, I don't think the whole field is wrong. Right? There's definitely good theories of economics that are pract- uh, that are practical and right. are important and useful and have helped society get better. But I think we've gotten to this like point where we think we know too much. Like once you're too confident about things, then the only really like it's a, it's a field where you don't get much actual experimentation. Like you don't get to enact a like a theory and say, "Oh, this is a hundred percent worked and it's attributable to our to the theory." And you know, policy doesn't work that way. There's, like Jeff said, an economy is such a overly complicated system. You can't just like determine that, like, "Oh, we did quantitative easing in two thousand eight and it worked." Right? The stock market went back up, <laughs> and and the unemployment rate went down. So it's like, "Oh, it worked." So. We, now we we know what works in the future. It's like, right? It's that, funny to even say it worked, right? Right? Because if if I'm someone who's completely unaffected by these policies, which I would argue a lot of people are, it's like, what do you mean it worked? They're just sitting there like, what? Yeah. What do you mean it worked? <laughs> right. A bunch of people patting each other on the back in like a room in Washington D.C. <laughs> are all determined like, oh, this was like the worst thing that could ever happen. And it was completely not stoppable, but we stopped it this way. And our theory <laughs> was successful. And it, like when you point to things, like that's the thing when you don't have controlled s- experiments. People are so willing to say, look what happened here. This worked. Look at the Tesla stock price. It just went up. Tesla's a good company to inv- have invested in. It's like, yeah, it's like, yeah, you could have potentially made money if you knew the future in the past. Like if you were thinking right. about buying Tesla at 500 and you knew the future, then yeah, you could have made money. But it's like, for those of us who can't tell the future, which is all of us, mm-hmm. right? It's <laughs> useless to say, oh, this stock did this, this ec- economic measure did that, and say, oh, this is attributable to this, attributable to this or to that, because it's like, there are so many different variables you can't even begin to understand. Um, so we got to try to do less. Um, yeah, do do less predicting, right? <laughs> Or do, and, uh, well, it's not predicting it's like do less um conclusion like f- drawing conclusions assuming yeah assuming and drawing conclusions yeah uh, and the point you brought up about controls i actually want to touch on that is like, that's such an important thing right so you could say look our policy worked but compared to what right, right. you have nothing to compare it to because you have no like You'd need another United States that existed at the same exact time with the same exact conditions. <laughs> and you only change one thing, which is your policy, and then you compare the two. That would be the only way to say this thing worked, right? You need controls. Yeah. That's how science is done. Right. And you can't have that in the real world because there there's too many variables. How are you supposed to control everything except one variable? You just can't. And so to say, oh, this policy was a success, it's almost impossible to do that. Yeah. All right. I think we, I think we nailed it. I think that's, yeah. that's a lot of good stuff. Freaking crushed it. <laughs> um, so thank you for doing less with us. We'll see. Greatest five time. stars. Yeah, we just rocketed past uh, 200 listens to our episodes. We're up to 215. <laughs> Which I actually really am appreciative because a lot of you have reached out to me, a lot of fa- f- friends and family listening to this um, episode have reached out and talked about interesting things that you've yeah. listened to us say. So we we love the feedback. Yeah, but uh, we we just want to reach more people. We want to get more people talking. You know, yeah. we don't necessarily want everyone to agree with us. That's not our goal here. We just want people to to talk about these ideas. We want to get them into the public discourse. That's that's our goal with this. So maybe we saw, we did ourselves a disservice by uh, talking about penetration. Maybe we'll <laughs> get people turned off because they think the it's... The people need to know, John. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's it. We're done. All right. <laughs> Signing yeah. off. The end. <laughs>